this amplifies a little bit. Um, well, um, thanks for the organizers for the invitation. Really excited to be here. First time in the, the institute for me, actually. Okay, so I want to talk about um, this classic model of uh, two-party communication complexity. And just to start off, I want to kind of gauge my audience today. I know varied backgrounds um, and put kind of one of the most basic puzzles one encounters in, in the two-party model. Um, so yeah, suppose I have Alice and Bob. They communicate over a shared communication channel. And let's just look at a, a particular problem they might want to solve. So maybe as input I give Alice an n-bit string, Bob an n-bit string, and they just try to figure out whether they're given the same input. So maybe you know, I have a terabytes worth of databases over there and there, and I just want to test whether those two databases are the same, like they're consistent. So how would you solve this with, by minimizing the number of bits that are communicated between the players? Um, so take this as a kind of a coding interview question. It's a maybe not super formally put, but how would you attack this? I want to hear ideas to see where my audience comes from. Yeah? Uh, okay, so that's n bits of communication. So that's uh, always, you can always solve uh, any communication problem by just sending the whole input. Can we do better is the question. Like how would you do this in practice? I mean, you probably wouldn't send terabytes just to compare. Okay, so that, that's also what I had in mind. Maybe you just hash the databases and compare the hashes. So actually, so hashing is something that requires randomness. So you can show, this is like the first exercise in this um, area of two-party communication complexity, is, is to show that any deterministic protocol that you know, always has to be correct, there's no better way than just sending the whole uh, input across. But okay, so if you're allowed randomness, then all of a sudden the complexity drops to, you can analyze just a constantly many bits suffice. So it's an important example, I really wanna make it explicit. So here's the hashing protocol. I assume the two players have access to shared source of randomness and I can interpret that shared source as uh, my hash function. So just consider a uniform random function that assigns any n bit string, maybe a two bit hash. So that's, Alice and both both think of the same uniform random function. They compute the hashes of their inputs and compare the hashes. So this is just two bits of, of a hash. So I guess it takes you know, two bits to send it across and the other player returns one bit saying, you know, did the hash match? So it's a very efficient protocol. It just has cost three and it has bounded error. So if you know, the players start with the same input, of course they get the same hash, they always accept. But if they are given different inputs, the probability that this two-bit uh, hash uh, erroneously uh, collides, so you get the same hash, is just uh, one over four. So you have a constant cost protocol with you know, constant, uh, small constant error. It's a, an example that maximally separates deterministic and randomized in this model. Okay, any questions about my example? Okay, so I wanna ask in this talk, what other two-party communication problems admit these hyper-efficient uh, protocols that have constant cost? So cost that does not depend at all uh, on the length of the input. And well, this is a kind of a new kind of question. So traditionally, I guess, um, two-party communication has existed since the 70s. People often consider protocols that communicate poorly logged many bits as efficient and polynomial or even sometimes linear uh, is as inefficient. So um, it's only recently that people have actually looked at, made a difference between poorly log and actual constant. So I did my PhD in sort of this area of communication, and I never thought that there's something special about a constant. I mean, it's a small number, like log n. But recently, we've really started asking, okay, let's make a difference. Let's really try to understand what you could do with constant cost. And, and it's an interesting perspective. Firstly, um, all the usual tools I used to use to analyze protocols, they break down in the constant cost regime. So that's interesting. I have to, to start from scratch and, and develop new tools. You'll also see today uh, only very few examples of problems that have these constant cost protocols, so we, we want more examples. 
This also means that we have loads of open problems about this area. So it's relatively new, and um, I'm just surprised that there's so much interesting math behind it. So, so we'll see uh, today. Um, okay, so I want to give you more examples of these uh, problems that have hyper-efficient protocols. Well, actually, yeah. So you're going to tell me how, how to do, uh, solve these problems. So let's look at, uh, so this is a problem that's called uh, tree adjacency. So here, Alice and Bob, they both um, play this game on a fixed large tree with maybe n nodes. So both players know the tree. And then as input, you know, both players are given a node of the tree. So maybe Bob uh, holds some node, Alice knows uh, some other node in the tree. And I just want to decide if the two nodes are adjacent in the tree. So I claim that this admits a very fast randomized communication protocol. Um, and I wonder if you can tell me what it is. I give you a hint. The quality problem has constant cost uh, protocol, as we just saw. So somehow, maybe there's a way of using equality tests to decide adjacency. So if you know, Alice and Bob are thinking of two nodes in the graph, at least that they can very quickly check if they're thinking of the same node. But OK, here we're asking for adjacency, not whether you're given the same node. So any ideas? Uh, how to attack there. Okay, so you're saying, uh, let's look at the parents <laughs> of the two nodes, and one, check whether the parents are the same. Yeah, so you check whether, okay, Bob's parent equals Alice's node, that's one equality check, or, or another way is uh, Alice computes her parent and, and compares it to Bob. So that's two equality tests. So you just run twice this constant cost protocol. Um, actually, when I was making the slides, I really wanted to rephrase this protocol as so that at some point we would check whether Bob's your uncle, but I couldn't find a, a way to do that. Okay, so that's another uh, constant cost problem. Let's make it a bit more difficult. So same problem, now instead of a tree, I have a planar graph. And again, the players are given nodes in the graph and they need to decide whether they're adjacent. So how would I solve this? I'll give you a hint. The tree adjacency problem has constant cost protocol like we just saw. So maybe there's a way of you know, using the tree adjacency here. Half-baked ideas are good, too. You can start there. Okay, that's right. So it, uh, you needed to know this non-trivial fact that... Um, so planar graphs are unions of at most, well, three forests. Um, okay, so we gave this tree adjacency protocol, but it actually works in a forest as well. Um, so the fact that uh, we can partition into three forests, we could run this tree adjacency or forest adjacency protocol in each forest. Um, so again, we have a problem that kind of reduces to, um, well, tree adjacency, which itself reduces to, to equality. Okay, so let me give you uh, more examples. So this is a bit more involved. Um, it's called the one hamming distance problem. So here, the players are given this n-bit strings as input. Um, now, I'm not, I don't want to test whether they're given the same input, but whether they differ in a single coordinate. So, you know, this would be an example of where the function evaluates to true. So, same input, except there's one difference somewhere. Um, you could also say that the problem is the same as uh, trying to decide adjacency in the hypercube graph, if you want. So, so a picture of that. Yeah. Are the two nodes given um, to the players are adjacent? Okay. Um, yeah, so this is a bit more tricky, maybe. Um, has anybody seen this before? How would you try to solve this really fast, decide whether there's a unique difference between them? I mean, we know how to test equality again, so... Uh, but this is not quite equality. 
We don't have to do constant cost immediately. Do we have some ideas how to do it relatively fast? Sorry? Okay, so yeah, like you, you could do binary search to find the difference. So I guess you could uh, first like just partition the bits into a left part and a right part, and you could just run equality on both sides. Um, so I guess here we would find that the left part is unequal. Well, you could maybe continue doing binary search to find an actual difference. Um, and once you found one difference, you can test whether the rest of the strings are equal or not. Um, but this is a little bit too inefficient. It uh, in invokes the equality protocol log n times. I mean, it's quite uh, not relatively efficient, but still not constant cost. Um, is there any shortcuts to doing binary search? So maybe a kind of a hint is now suppose I'm in the no case and there are two differences between the strings, so maybe there's another difference somewhere in here. If it happens that one difference is on the left, another difference is on the right, and you know you do equality on both sides, you find that both sides of the input are unequal. So that's, you quickly learn that actually the Hamming distance is more than one. So that's if the two differences happen to lie one in left, one in right. But um, how can I do this more general? Like no matter where the two differences are, you could always detect that. Maybe using randomness. Okay, so don't do left, right, just do a uniform random partition into two parts and do equality. So now if there are two differences or more, you're likely, your random partition of the domain is likely to put some differences on the the first part and some differences on the other part. So you get unequal, unequal parts, and that's, uh, you can um, you know, detect that the Hamming distance is more than one. Okay, so that um, protocol actually generalizes to the K Hamming distance problem where you know, instead of one difference I'm looking, is there exactly K differences? Uh, so the protocol, one protocol there is uh, if you want to decide k Hamming distances, maybe you do this random partition into k squared buckets. So the idea is that you know, k squared, it means by birthday paradox that you're going to expect one difference in each bucket. So if you do k squared buckets at random, you run equality in all of them, you find k, you know, more than k unequal buckets, then uh, you know the Hamming distance is more than k. And okay, you can optimize that to get even this k log k bound for this problem, which is, um, was recently shown to be optimal. So the k Hamming distance problem, it has constant cost if k is a, is a constant. Okay, so that's a, another example of a constant cost protocol. Let me do one more example. So um, let's do Hamming distance, but on an alphabet larger than just the Boolean one. So maybe here I have strings from an alphabet of size four. And I'm still asking, is there a you know, unique position where the symbols differ? Okay, I could still do the same protocol as before. I could bucket the input coordinates and run equality. Um, but instead of redoing the protocol, let me show another way of, of solving this to kind of reduce it to the Boolean case. So it's kind of interesting. You could do this encoding trick to the inputs. So you could take you know, each symbol in the large alphabet string, encode it in binary. So if I have a four-sized alphabet, I'm giving a four-bit encoding where I just put one one in there to indicate which symbol was used. So you know, the first symbol was used, second symbol, third symbol, and so on. So if both players does do this kind of indicator encoding of their large alphabet strings, then what happens is that if there was a unique difference originally, that translates into now there being, you know, two, uh, well, one symbol is different, so in their encodings you get a uh, difference two um, in the Boolean world. So this encoding kind of reduces it to the Boolean case, and you can just run this like two Hamming distance protocol from the previous slide um, for this problem. Okay, so this is another way 
uh, of, of solving this problem fast. Okay, so uh, questions about Hamming distance, large Hamming, I'll put that Hamming distance. Because that's all the examples I have. Um, I'd like to give more, but there's none. So <laughs> what I showed you are basically essentially the only problems we knew of that had constant cost communication protocols. Um, and I want to make more precise the word essential. Like what, like I want to impose some structure on this uh, jungle of problems. And so what do we do as uh, complexity theorists? We want to um, you know, build a kind of a classification of problems through reductions. Okay, so it's a standard idea. And you can play this game in this world of constant cost communication. So we already saw you know, these three examples and sort of why they re reduce to each other. So planar adjacency we solve by running the tree adjacency protocol thrice. So it's a kind of you know, one problem reduces to another. But you can make this formal. You can define a formal notion of reduction. So I say A reduces to B. If I can solve this communication problem A deterministically by making a few constant number of oracle queries to the problem B. So just kind of I show you a picture of what it looks like. So what does it mean to solve a problem A using an oracle to B? Uh, well, it's a, a protocol where Alice and Bob, they're gi given some inputs to the problem A. Okay, they want to solve problem A, but I give them the power to solve the problem B for free. So based on their inputs, they can you know, pre-process them somehow, maybe you know, compute a hash or um, encode them somehow. And then they can send uh, a query to the cloud that, that holds this oracle that uh, can solve problem B at unit cost. So the two players, they submit this query, you know, x prime, y prime to the cloud. The cloud responds with just one bit, yes or no. Was the query a yes or a no input uh, to the problem B? So the two players, they just learn um, whether the query was a yes or no. That's one bit response. And then they can do this constantly many times. They can kind of invoke this oracle constantly many uh, times. So that's kind of the formal notion of a reduction. And you know, one should just check that it, this is designed so that if B actually admits a constant cost protocol and there's a reduction from A to B, then I get a constant cost protocol for A. Um, but yeah, it's important that the reduction is determinist. You don't use randomness in the uh, reduction. So the, the whole point is we want to understand what is the power of randomness you know, in this class of constant cost. So we make um, our notion of reduction weaker, insisting on only deterministic reductions. Questions about reductions? OK, so these reductions they actually can be made formal. And in fact, I claim that there's even a reduction in the other direction. I claim equality can be solved by a reduction to planar adjacency. So for some sort of a planar graph, I can use it to solve equality. What, what would that be? How would I solve equality if I assume I can solve planar adjacency uh, efficiently? Like what kind of a graph should I look at so that basically that, the adjacency in that graph embeds the equality problem? Somebody said matching. That's right. So, yeah, you think of a large matching, in fact, of size 2 to the n. Okay. Um, Alice would just map her input x to the xth edge, and okay, left side of the xth edge. And then Bob would do the right side of the yth edge. So now, you know, the two inputs are equal if and only if they, you know, you pick the same edge um, in the matching. So, now, all of these problems are sort of equivalent. I didn't even give you three different examples. It's, they're the same example. They're all equivalent to uh, equality. So that you know, imposes some structure on this class. 
And okay, I also discussed this uh, one Hamming distance problem. Um, so equality reduces to one Hamming distance. I mean, the reduction is very simple. I guess if you start with x and y, and you want to know whether those guys are the same, well, Alice can append maybe one to her input, Bob can append zero to their input, and uh, now the strings are equal if and only if their Hamming distance is one. So that's a very simple reduction. Uh, but actually, so it was shown recently that the Hamming distance problem is strictly harder. So there's no reduction the other way. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. You can't uh, solve Hamming distance, one Hamming distance, with constantly many oracle queries to equality. Um, if you remember the way we solved it, we you know, partitioned the domain randomly. So that was like a non it was a, not a deterministic uh, step. Um, so no, no efficient deterministic reductions the other way around. And actually, so more recently, just uh, from this summer, there's a result saying that more generally, the Hamming distance hierarchy is proper. So if you look at k-Hamming distance, you increase k, you're actually getting increasingly harder problems. So um, uh, not just that the equality um, uh, is kind of uh, weaker than one Hamming, but, but you get an infinite hierarchy uh, this way. So this was a result of my postdoc and others uh, from stock this year. But then it's kind of nice. So it puts basically all the examples we know of in this uh, regime, like uh, understands all the relationships between them. But I guess the big question it doesn't answer is, is this everything? Is, is constant cost communication just studying Hamming distance? And, and that's it. Um, that would be a bit, um, I don't know, not a very satisfying state of affairs. Given that there's loads of work that has studied this constant cost uh, regime. And, and it can get kind of involved. I think people study... Uh, even uh, Louis Esperet, I think, is uh, part of this, is studying like, distance k connectivity in Cartesian products of planar graphs. So something um, you know, seemingly involved, yet so far uh, all of these protocols are just clever reductions to Hamming distance. So the prior work has left open, well, is this really all we can do, just like uh, this Hamming distance computation? Does every constant cost randomized problem reduce to some uh, Hamming distance problem. Okay, so this is uh, the kind of main result I want to report today is, well, the answer is no, there's more to constant cost communication than just this Hamming distance uh, problem. So I want to tell you about a new problem that does not reduce to Hamming distance. You can't solve this by just constant Hamming distance queries, which is neat, sort of says, um, you know, this class is quite rich. Um, but I guess I should say, sort of necessarily, my problem I'm going to present is rather artificial. Okay, so, so why? Okay, uh, I would say the field has had several decades of worth of time to come up with natural problems. Okay, and so far, the only ones of constant cost have been the Hamming distance problems. So, okay, nobody's ever really sat down and thought, okay, what kind of weird problems can I do in constant cost? But, but at least in the past, people have proposed natural problems. And so none of those, except Hamming distance, turned out to have constant cost. So the one we now exhibit is slightly artificial. Um, but I think what's more interesting even about this, like constructing an artificial problem, is how do we show that, you know, um, you cannot reduce it to Hamming distance. And this is, involves a new connection to uh, coding theory. And it's actually this coding theory connection that drew me into this project. Um, so I want to get to uh, at least stating the, um, the new coding theory connection that, that we found. Uh, but okay, so let me just show you the new problem. Uh, let's try to understand uh, uh, what's happening there. So it's, okay, it's a variation of Hamming distance, but there's a twist. Okay, so it's a bit involved, so let's uh, take it slow. Um, so the input to this problem is both players, they now get, um, well, n squared bits, which I think of as Boolean matrices. The input, both players get a 
Boolean matrix. And then you're supposed to output yes if, well, all of the rows of the matrices are equal. So the i row equals the i row of the other player, except two rows. There are two unequal rows. But moreover, I insist that those two unequal rows, they both have distance four. Okay, so we call this the four for Hamming distance problem. Okay, so again, the inputs are Boolean matrices, and I require really two things. I require there are exactly two unequal rows, and then when you look at the distances for those two unequal rows, in both cases you get four. Uh, okay, so now it's a bit of a mystical problem, um, but let's explore it a little bit. My first claim is that it does admit a constant cost protocol. This is not hard to see. Uh, in fact, you've seen all the tricks already. So what is the protocol to solve this? Again, I say you have to check two things, two unequal rows, and that the distances are four, four. You, to check that there are two unequal rows, it's just running the large alphabet Hamming distance problem. You can think of each row as a symbol in an exponentially sized alphabet. So the players just have n rows, so n symbols, and you wanna know are two of those symbols different? Okay, that's the large Hamming distance uh, two uh, problem. So we know how to do that. And then to check that you really do get four and four for the distances. Now you could randomly partition the rows into two pieces. So I guess you use shared randomness to partition them, something like this. And then you just check in the first part that the global distance is four, and in the second part the distance is also four. So maybe you have to try a few random partitions, but when you find this split into 4-4, four, four, now you can be convinced that you're in the, the yes case of the function. Okay, so um, yeah, any questions about the definition of this, uh, this weird 4-4 four, four Hamming distance problem? So I claim, again, we just saw it has a constant cost protocol, but this is a weird enough problem that you cannot solve with, with just constantly many deterministic queries to just the plain old Hamming distance um, oracle. Yeah, so it's important in, for intuition that even though I can maybe compute one Hamming distance, I never learn exactly where the difference is. Right? If I would learn that, that intuitively that's like log n bits of information, but I just have constant cost uh, protocol. So at best I can you know, find a bucket where I know that they're unequal or something like this. But uh, yeah, just uh, good for intuition. So, uh, okay, ask again. Yeah. So I, <clears throat> so I think it's the first step of the protocol is I just ensure that all the rows are the same except for two. So this is a large alphabet Hamming distance problem. Each row is a symbol in an alphabet. Yeah. Okay. So I guess like one question I'm begging you to ask is, well, what's special about 4-4? Four, four? And I mean, in short, it's like the smallest value for which the theorem is true and for which it's convenient to prove it. But maybe just to illustrate it, like let's look at a uh, two to Hamming distance problem. So, oh, is there a question? Yeah. Uh, the lesson does totally read, read to uh, Hamming distance and all the other ones, but can you maybe understand bounding or can you assume in bounding for small value you do small bit? Like, yeah. So maybe you're asking like, 
going from, so this is uh, in the large Hamming distance problem, I guess now our sim, uh, alphabet size is two to the n, very big number. So uh, you know, if you would run through the reductions, it's actually a reduction that really blows up the length of the input. But that's fine, for a constant cost, we don't care about the length of the input. It's another weird uh, phenomenon in this theory. But okay, so let me illustrate why the theorem is not true for two to Hamming distance. So this is a problem that actually does admit a reduction to the, the plain old Hamming distance problem. Um, so let me give you an oracle reduction. Uh, so again, I, this problem, I wanna find two unequal rows, but now I insist the distances are exactly two and two. Okay, so here's a, how this problem could be solved with just uh, querying Hamming distance. So I again start by checking that there are two unequal rows. Okay, that's this large alphabet Hamming distance problem which itself reduces to Hamming distance. So that's just a Hamming distance query. And then I check that the two matrices globally their distance is four. Okay, so now I know there are two unequal rows. And the global distance is four. So the two unequal rows, the only cases that remain are maybe the distances are one and three or two and two. So these are the two cases that remain and I wanna rule out that we're in the case one, three, okay. And so the key here is I can actually distinguish it between these two cases because of parity issues. So here I have distances that are all even, here they're all odd. So there's a, a parity trick I can use, which is I can record for each row the parity of that row. So Alice would compute this vector x, which is, well, for each row you compute their parity. I'm not actually doing this correctly, but. So you record the parities for each row. Bob does the same, and then you just compare these parities. You have these n-bit strings, are they equal? It's an equality oracle query. If the parities match, it means that for each row, they have the same parity, so they're distance must be even. So when you check that these parity vectors match, you're actually checking each row, their Hamming distance is even. So this check, okay, it passes in the case that I have even Hamming distances and it uh, doesn't pass here. So that's, I can, I'm able to reject in that case. Okay. But we claim that you know, the 4-4 four, four case is one that where you don't have a reduction to Hamming distance. And in the remaining like five or so means, I just wanna tell you the key lemma that we prove in the paper that yields this um, uh, impossibility uh, result. And again, this is what my postdoc put to me. And I thought this is very beautiful. It's a, you don't have to know any background. So if you've been drowsing off uh, so far, you can wake up again, because I'm going to propose um, a very clean coding theoretic question. Uh, no background required. Um, and uh, so to my knowledge, it hasn't really been quite studied. So I think it's a very nice kind of new connection. Okay, so I have to go through one hairy definition, but but let's um, look at this carefully. So I wanna look at um, encoding functions. So they take some n-bit string and they encode it um, as an m-bit string. So we get to choose m. And I wanna say that such an encoding function is an f code where you know, f is some um, uh, function that at least uh, associates with distances four, two, four, six, you know, some um, other distances. So I, I, I wanna look at codes whose pairwise distances are transformed according to F. So uh, I want, the code is an F code if, if I start with two code words that are at distance D, so where D is, you know, one of these small distances, two, four, six, and I apply the code, so I start with X and Y, I apply the code, and the co encoding spits out, well, E of Y and E of X. And the distance is now transformed consistency. It started out as D and now it becomes F of D. So I have a, an F code if small Hamming distances are consistently transformed into some other Hamming distances. I don't care what the code does for you know, larger distances as long as you know, you're one of these uh, 
in the small values, you should consistently transform um, uh, those distances. So we're asking, like, what are possible F codes? The, uh, prove a structure theorem for um, such uh, you know, encodings that transform distances. Claim is any infinite family of F codes has to have a f uh, behave affinely on these uh, three numbers, these three distances. So if you can exhibit me any family of encodings, so they exist for infinitely many n, then this f function cannot be arbitrary. It has to have structure. In particular, it's, um, it's like a fine. The, the middle value of the function is the average of the endpoints. So if you think of the three values, they form an arithmetic progression. So you can't have like these, these encoding functions for arbitrary f only for these very structured ones. And I just want to give you examples to kind of illustrate this lemma. Let, like, why should it be true? Um, so here's one example encoding function. So it takes an n bit string and it outputs, this is like the repetition code. It outputs x concatenated with x. So it you know, doubles the input size. So what happens here? If I start with code words that are at distance d, now they map to a pair whose distance is 2d. So it doubles distances. Okay, so I guess if I would write the graph of f, okay, it would be this kind of linear function. So it's a linear function, that's good. It satisfies the lemma, right? Uh, uh, we didn't you know, disprove <laughs> our lemma by this example. Uh, more examples, um, and we've seen this before, the indicator encoding. So I take an n-bit string and I encode it as this exponentially long string, so 2 to the n, and it has just a 1 in position x. Okay, so this is what we used in the large alphabet uh, protocol. So what happens here to Hamming distances? Okay, if I start with... You know, okay, so zero always maps to zero. If I start with the same input, I get the same output. But whenever I have two distinct inputs and I encode them, their distance becomes two. So the graph associated with this code looks like this. So it doesn't quite look like a linear function, although it is when you restrict it to the even numbers, like you disregard the, the zero. Okay, so it again satisfies this uh, coding lemma. Okay, one more example. We've actually seen this in another reduction, mm. the, the parity code. So the input is an n-bit string, and I just output the parity of that string. So one bit of output. Well, here, the associated curve is, well, very, very nonlinear, seemingly. But again, if you restrict to the even numbers, well, it becomes a fine. Okay, so at least the lemma holds for all these examples. And basically, we end up showing that these examples are the only ones. And you can combine them in various ways, but, but um, the on, only um, infinite families um, uh, are a fine on the even numbers. Okay, so what's kind of striking is that uh, there's a very intimate connection between this constant cost question of can I reduce 4-4 to Hamming distance and this <coughs> coding lemma in that they're equivalent. So we'll eventually, of course, want to prove our main result. So, you know, we use this coding theoretic lemma and you know, a bunch of Ramsey theory to conclude that the you know, reduction does not exist. But... Um, I want to give you a quick idea of why would there even be a connection between these uh, uh, statements. So there's a, an easy converse. If you show the con there's no reduction from 4-4 to Hamming distance, then you must prove this structural lemma about these F codes. So it's you know, plainly e equivalent. And because this is so easy, let me in like one minute at least sketch now, what is the connection to, to, um, uh, in one direction? So I want to show this direction, and that's, um, you know, let's do the contrapositive. 
Okay. Suppose there existed these weird non-affine codes. Well, in that case, I could give you a reduction to Hamming distance. Um, and just because I'm out of time, I'm just going to kind of highlight, you know, what does the reduction look like? So you're doing a bunch of stuff we've already seen. You know, you want to solve 4-4, four, four, so you check two unequal columns, you check global distance, uh, so that leaves some cases for the two distances. You do the parity trick. You're only left with having to distinguish 4-4 four, four from 2-6. So how do you do that? Well, now you use this impossible non-assigned code. So you, your input is, are these matrices, and if you apply your you know, hypothetical non-affine code to each row, well, that encoding transforms distances 4-4 four, four to F4, F4. So after the encoding, in the good case, okay, our distance is uh, equals 2 times F4. So if I do a check like this, I pass in the good case. In the case I need to reject, um, the distances after encoding are F2 plus F6. Okay, but that does not equal this number, you know, because I'm looking at a non-affine code. So this is a, a very quick uh, indication of how you can use such weird codes to create reductions. But okay, the main result is in the, the other way. That in fact, the only way to reduce uh, for a, such a reduction exists is to do something like this, where, where you're kind of encoding each row of the matrix. And, and that would give us the uh, you know, impossible family of codes. Okay, so there are loads of open problems in this area. Um, if you, uh, kind of, if this piques your interest, I really recommend this survey by the Hatami brothers uh, from March of this year. So they have, uh, they kind of lay out exactly what are the kind of uh, you know, open questions in this regime of, of constant cost communication with connections to things like you know, sign rank and, and, and so forth. But okay, so I wanna end there. So thank you.